good evening good noon good afternoon to participants in this iump school webinar on artificial intelligence in medical physics and medicine and challenges and opportunities on this subject i am madan rehani president international organization for medical physics iump we have the great pleasure of today listening to professor steve jiang who is vice chair department of radiation oncology and i will say a few words about him in a minute and in the meantime uh, next slide i want to announce that the next iump school webinar on artificial intelligence will be on 9th july at the same time and we will have two speakers in that as mentioned here next slide so i will now introduce the speaker of today professor uh, steve jiang he is a person who has made so many achievements he started with the after his phd the post doctoral training at stanford university then he was faculty for some time at our hospital mass general hospital harvard medical school in the radiation oncology department and then uh, he was recruited uh, to the university of california san diego as a associate professor uh, to build the center for advanced radiotherapy technologies he became full professor there and then he moved as a full professor to the university of texas southwestern medical center he is currently vice chair of radiation radiation oncology department and director of the medical physics and engineering division he has been fellow of aapm and institute of physics he has variety of research projects in the area of cancer radiotherapy and he has been funded uh, substantially by federal state charitable and industrial grants for over 15 million us dollars resulting in over 200 peer reviewed uh, publications in journals and has a h index of 75 which is really remarkable his current research interest is on development of and deployment of uh, artificial intelligence technologies to solve medical problems he has guided 30 post doctoral fellows and 10 phd students and i will not stand long between him and you to have uh, further interaction on how we can uh, learn from artificial intelligence because we are going to use artificial intelligence almost all of us in the coming years so i pass on now the floor to professor jian stay please okay um let me share my screen first and then start the smash in the meantime while he is doing may i kindly ask uh, all participants to switch off their cameras to allow enough bandwidth and also mute themselves and please use the chat for questions putting your questions thank you okay. steve please can you see my powerpoint file yes, please yeah okay so uh good morning good afternoon and good evening so it's quite a interesting experience uh, to give a talk to to you know so many people from all over the world at the same time right my first time doing this kind of things so so today i have like to share uh some of our work and thoughts about artificial intelligence in medical physics in physics and oncology and also in medicine in general so so this talk has three parts first i would like to produce you know ai ai in medicine and then uh i will also introduce some of uh, our work uh, in our lab called the maya lab medical artificial intelligence and uh, automation lab uh i i just mentioned a few projects out of so many work we have been working on and then i will focus on the uh you know problems when we try to introduce ai in our clinical practice 
you know, what are the challenges, what are the major challenges and how we should, uh, how we may be able to deal with those uh, problems. So there are the three parts. As I'll start with a quick introduction to AI. So I hope you agree with me that AI is changing our world. <clears throat> AI is everywhere now. And uh, this video shows me uh, how to go to work and come home every day. So this is literally I do this. Uh, after three, almost three years, I'm very confident that this is safe, right? Um, so in the meanwhile, I also think AI is going to transform healthcare. Uh, I totally believe that. So that's why, you know, started a few years ago, we decided to focus our research on AI in medicine, in metaphysics. Uh, so for what is AI? I hope everybody knows this quite well now, but I'll give you a very brief, uh, you know, definition of that. Uh, basically, AI can learn from our human's past experience and data and can continuously learn by interacting with the environment and can perform human tasks better, faster, cheaper. So that's three components in this definition. But second one I think is important. So people also talk about machine learning, deep learning, uh, artificial intelligence. They are not exactly the same. If you look at this uh, uh, diagram, it shows you deep learning is part of machine learning. Machine learning is part of AI. And also machine learning uh, is not only supervised learning because a lot of, most of the times, when we talk about deep learning, machine learning, it's supervised learning, you know, which is like you have uh, input of the model, then you have labels on the output side. So you turn a regression type of model, right? Uh, or classification. But there are also unsupervised learning uh, for clustering, for uh, many other applications, and also there are reinforcement learning. So currently, if you look at uh, a lot of research in medicine using AI, you see, okay, there's a big model and then they use big data set, like more than 100,000 patients. If you look at those uh, high profile work, meaning those papers published in high impact journals like Nature, Nature Medicine, that kind of stuff. So like I said, this is AI, machine learning, deep learning, and then their relationship with uh, data mining, data science with big data is kind of like this, right? So there is an overlap between deep learning and big data. That's where it is hot right now. You know, a lot of research is in that area. So when we talk about AI, people will think about, oh, that's deep learning, that's big data, right? So that kind of work, like I said, when you do supervised learning with big data, it could be powerful and able to retrieve hidden information from big data. You know, uh, one example is, you look at Google research earlier work, uh, they look at uh, retina images. Then they can tell a lot of uh, cardiovascular information such as is this person or male or female? What's the age of this person? Blood pressure, BMI. So by simply looking at someone's retina image, you can tell a lot of information with deep learning, which you cannot do with any human eyes, right? So AI is very powerful in retrieving hidden information from big data. Uh, and then it can achieve performance comparable or better uh, than experienced clinicians. Uh, of course, there are problems such as it requires big data, but in medicine, uh, in radiation oncology we, or, or radiology, we know it's not very often to have like a a data set with more than 100,000 patients. You know, when we perform a clinical trial, you know, we talk about hundreds or, you know, even less uh, number of patients in a trial, right? So in this kind of supervised learning with big data, it's, there is not much intelligence. And I, so I, I have this linear regression here. In this model, you have two parameters. In deep learning, deep supervised learning, yeah, you have, you know, hundreds or tens of hundreds of thousands, millions parameters, a lot of more parameters, but essentially it's still regression, right? 
So people could regress in on steroids. This brute force, blank box, and static. So a lot of issues with existing work. So one example is the earlier work three years ago, Stanford group published this paper in Nature. Uh, they can classify skin cancer uh, uh, with deep learning, but like I said, you need a lot of uh, images to train other, right? So that was a brief introduction. Uh, then I will share a little bit of our work at Maya Lab. So we have about 10 faculty members, 30, 40 postdocs students in our lab. Um, so we are trying to innovate, develop, and apply AI to empower clinicians, especially those with less experience or limited resources for improved patient care. So that is our goal of this uh, uh, research lab. So first, when there is a ground truth, like you, know, you can do supervised learning or you have label data, uh, you can retrieve information to improve the accuracy. Uh, then you can have a better uh, diagnosis, better uh, clinical decision making. Uh, but then a lot of times we can automate uh, clinical procedures and then physician, we can save physicians time, then they can treat more patients or they can spend more time with patients instead of sitting in front of computers all the time. So there is a data showing on average, there's about 50% of, of physicians time spending with computers, not with patients, right? So we want to re reduce that time so that they can spend more time talking to patients, working with patients. So this is called to rehumanize medicine. And then a lot of times there is no ground truth, you know, so then AI can still learn without, you know, AI can still learn from, uh, you know, experienced physicians to consider that kind of ground truth, even though that's not real ground truth. Uh, then we can pass on that kind of learned experience from experienced physicians to less experienced physicians. So we believe this is actually is a very important application of AI you can use it to reduce healthcare disparities. So those are the three main areas we want to focus on. I, I, I give you an example. This is a recent work, just got an FDA clearance uh, back in uh, February of this year. So this company, startup company developed the AI software that can help doctors, technicians to take ultrasound uh, echograms, uh, ultrasound picture of the heart. So essentially you place the probe on uh, someone's chest, then the AI software can tell you, you know, where to move the probe and also uh, how to move it. And then in the meanwhile, the software can automatically, you know, capture the good images. So basically anyone can take, can take an ultrasound, in this case it's a heart, so it's uh, echograms. Anyone can take echograms uh, without uh, echocardiograms, without uh, training. So this is very useful work, in my opinion, uh, especially in resource-limited countries, regions, right? So in this work, we see three things that we like. It, it empowers clinicians with AI. We're not trying to replace clinicians. It will automate and augment clinical procedures uh, this is not just, you know, when people talk about AI, again, it's big data, data science, informatics, this is beyond that. And also reduce healthcare disparity. Imagine, you know, anyone can do this, like a, you know, person without, with the minimum medical training in Africa can do this. Then if there's a smartphone, then this image can be uh, captured with a smartphone and send it to someone in another place for like telemedicine, right? So this is cool. So we also work on medical image segmentation like everywhere else, which is a hot area. A lot of work has been done in this area. So we focus on challenging organs and the gross tumor clinical target uh, segmentation. I'll, I'll talk about details later. We spend a lot of efforts on treatment planning using AI. I, I'll give you some examples. For example, my colleague Dan Wen, uh, he, uh, actually first uh, studied the feasibility of predicting 
optimal detection levels based on you know patient's anatomy, and uh, you know so th this was uh, the first posted on archive in September 2017, but it took more than a year to publish. So then he you know did a lot of work, and our group did a lot of work to make this technology more mature. However, there are a lot of challenges out there in order to have a practical those prediction model works for any tumor sites, any uh, treatment modalities, beam setups, energies, physicians, hospitals, there's still a long way to go. So my colleague Chen Yangsen and Xun Jia, they did other work to use deep reinforcement learning for more intelligent treatment planning. So essentially, you know, like for example, in this case is HDR, you know, to get a good plan, you need to, you know, tune the organ weights to reach a good balance of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tumor coverage and uh, organ sparing. In this case, they use uh, deep reinforcement learning to tune the weights automatically. And you can see this is how the weights changes. This is how the D2CC dose for different organs decreases with the weights uh, being tuned. And then this is the final plan versus the clinical uh, clinician's plan you can see there's a uh, improvement in organ sparing without, um, uh, for, I mean, for the same uh, tumor coverage. So they also applied, you know, same idea to IMRT planning, uh, tuning organ weights automatically using deep reinforcement learning. So this is how the weights changes. This is how the plan IQ score goes up with that. And this is the initial, it starts with this kind of DVH curve. After 25 steps, this is solid nine, a great improvement uh, of the plan. So they have done a lot more work. Uh, uh, a few more papers are coming out soon with better, more intelligent, more efficient uh, plan tuning. So essentially we want to tune all the hyperparameters uh, in the planning process automatically. We also did some work to use deep learning for dose calculation because we had a, this hypothesis, you know, if on the input side of your model, if you have a very simple dose calculation result, such as retracing, and on the output side, if you have, uh, you know, the most accurate dose, result, dose calculation result, such as um, Monte Carlo simulation. So what is the difference between input and output? The primary radiation uh, is taken care of by ray tracing quite well, and also including the homogeneity effect on that. What's missing is the scatter dose, right? And, uh, and also the homogeneity effect on scatter dose and uh, all, all the other, I call it secondary effects. So we believe deep learning can capture, can learn that kind of uh, uh, remaining effects. So we found this is true. Uh, you input is the retracing, output is, uh, in this case, is not a monocolor, this is uh, like a, a CCCS, but it can be any of those uh, distribution uh, calculation on the output side. So in this feasibility study paper, you found, we found that you can improve, uh, you, you can achieve very good accuracy and efficiency. So, so this kind of work can be used not only for secondary dose check, which is good for secondary dose check because it's a completely different system, right? And also it can be used, uh, you know, for example, doing an MRT or VMAT plan optimization, you need fast intermediate step dose complex. Also you need the uh, plan casting for online ART fast. All these kind of uh, situations where you need real-time efficiency and reasonable accuracy, this is good, right? So, uh, our postdoc Penelope and also colleague Yu Zhang, they applied the same idea to Eclipse planning system where you have AAA and you have uh, uh, Acuras. So from AAA to Acuras, you can use deep learning to improve the efficient, uh, accuracy a lot, right? And uh, another student, Chao Wu, he applied this idea to put on those calculations from pencil beam to Monte Carlo those calculations and also got very good results. Another work is to optimize the, the beam angle. In this case, we call BOO, beam orientation optimization. And we see a strong analogy between AlphaGo 
and the, in this case, it's CyberNet. It can be a full pan Emac. So AlphaGo tries to find out the optimal next move to win the game. And here, you try to find out what's the next you know, good gantry angle or node to have the best treatment for this patient, right? So we use similar idea with version one, we published um, this actually this year, uh, you know, training product data work using supervised learning, uh, using uh, column generation data as input. Version two, we added the Monte Carlo tree search. Now we're working on version three to have both accuracy and efficiency achieved. And also another project is uh, my colleague Jim Wang's project, uh, re retrieving functional information from 40 CT scan of the lung. In this case, inhale and exhale scan. And then you can have ventilation image. And uh, also from Gene Wang's group, uh, they uh, actually uh, did an interesting work to identify the malignancy of the cervical lymph nodes. So physicians can, when treat head and neck cancer, they know which lymph nodes are involved, should be part of the PTV, right? So this is actually, uh, has been uh, tested, validated through a prospective phase two clinical trial. Uh, so this is uh, one of the few uh, AI work that is being validated prospectively through a clinical trial. Another work is to use um, AI for you know, smart clinic. And we developed a Bluetooth low energy based uh, RTLS real-time localization system. So you can track the patients, you can track the staff, you can track the equipment, you can track the bowlers, mask, you know, all these kind of accessories for patient's treatment in the building, right? So we have uh, developed this system by ourselves and this system only works with AI. If traditional triangulation down work if the signal is not stable, not perfectly linear, uh, but with deep learning, with uh, some intelligence there, actually it, it works very well to track, you know, patients or whatever you want to track. So we have been using this in a clinic for a while for different applications, such as this one, right? We developed this uh, touch pad application. So we automatically check if, uh, you know, for this patient, if we have everything here, do we have the bowlers here? Do we have the right mask? Do we have everything, right? We will check everything automatically and to improve the uh, safety. So I'll talk about some challenges. Like there are a lot of papers uh, out there, like a, a lot of you know, high profile papers, right? You know, Nature or JAMA or whatever. But how many AI work has been used in a clinic practice? Not many, right? If you think about it, not many. Not only because, not only because they have not got FDA clearance. I think the main reason is there are a lot of challenges, a lot of problems not solved yet. There is a gap between AI research and the AI clinical uh, application. So I'll identify a few gaps. You know, why is the data size? Data size, is, uh, it's uh, like I said, in, in medicine, we don't have, uh, we don't often have large data size, large size data sets. So that's a problem. And also the data uh, heterogeneity uh, your AI model may not work for others because your data sets, your data distribution is not different. And also there's no one source a lot of times. So how do you do, how do you handle your AI in that, in that situation? And also the model has bias, right? And uh, longitudinal data variation, your model stream today may not work three, five years later. Uh, clinical data quality because you train your model with clinical data, right? Even if you remove all the mislabeled data that kind of stuff, still, you know, the original data creation by clinicians, uh, they are not created equal, right? Because clinicians are, you know, have different experience, different uh, level of skills, that kind of stuff. Medicine data curacy and the community is very expensive, right? And also model explainability is an issue and model robustness. So I'll, I'll discuss in a very casual way uh, a few of those issues illustrated with some uh, you know, examples 
And this is not a comprehensive overview or review of all these issues, right? I, like I said, we want, I just want to have a kind of informal discussion with you on those interesting topics, such as data heterogeneity, right? So like I said, distributions can be different for different institutions, different machines, different scanners, different physicians, different patient cohorts. There are so many variables out there. So the model trained with data set A may not work for data set B, right? So also, you know, when people say, hey, the model doesn't work well, let's just add more data, right? It's not always uh, a good idea because it's not, not always the more data, the better results. So Jim Stowe's group at Stanford did an interesting study, uh, I think last year, and uh, uh, they look at the UK biobank data trying to predict the breast and the skin cancer. They look at its shift value uh, to look at the contribution of each city in UK, uh, the contribution of each city to the performance of the model. Of course, they found different cities have different levels of contribution. Some will contribute more, some will to do less, we found there was one city, I think it, uh, it was Nottingham, which contributed negatively. So meaning if you add the data from this city, the model training, the model performance will go down. So that is very interesting, right? Uh, so many people, now it's better. You know, when I made this slide a couple of years ago, they train the model and test the model with their own data, and then they publish a paper. Say, hey, good results, but you have no idea how this model will work for other people's data, right? There's no idea about the model generability. So now many journals start to request, hey, you have to train it, you after you train your data with whatever, or train your model with whatever data you have, you have to test it, test it with at least one external data set, right? So that's not a step forward, it's good, but what does that mean? Even if it works for this one external data set, that's just one data point, right? Is that enough? You know, how do you show, how do you demonstrate the model generability in an efficient and sufficient way? That is a very challenging problem, right? And also, I, many people, I still say that right now, it's been like that for, for many, for some years, I would say. People still think we can, develop a universal model that works anywhere, anytime for anybody. You know, if it does not work, that means we don't have any more data, enough data, just add more data. I just get data from, you know, 100 hospitals or for, you know, 100,000 patients. Then the model should work for everybody, right? So that's kind of philosophy is still out there, which I disagree, because if you're working in a real clinical world, you know how difficult to share the data, right? How difficult to get that kind of data size of data set. You know, I've been working with other institutions trying to get their data after signing the agreements and all this and that. It's still, you know, we cannot get the data after years of uh, negotiation and there are so many problems for data sharing. Federated learning may help, but now won't solve the problem in my opinion. So I think uh, a solution, no, actually I give you an example with this universal model, why it doesn't work. So this paper was published in Nature, again from Google, right? Uh, Google Health. Uh, on January 1st of this year, I believe. So the trend, uh, this is for breast cancer screening based on uh, mammography. Uh, and they trained the model using two UK data sets. A lot of patients there got the AUC about 0.89. And then they tested on one USA data set from a hospital in Chicago area with smaller data uh, number of patients, uh, you can see the performance reduced by 10% roughly, but still considered very good. So then they claim, and also they compare with the average of six radiologists. It's better than the average of six radiologists. So yeah, they are very happy for, with that, with that. So they claim, we provide evidence of the ability of the system to generalize from UK to US. I don't know if you, if you agree with this claim, but I have doubts, right? Like I said, it is just one data point from USA, you know, from one hospital. Then I look at the paper. Uh, most images were acquired with devices of the same vendor, right? You don't even know this model will work for another vendor, 
or another patient population or another clinical protocol. You have no idea. So this kind of claim, I think it's too much, right? But how do you solve this problem? Generalizability problem is a challenge. I'll show you our solution. I don't believe this, I don't believe in this kind of universal models. I believe in, you know, automated model commissioning. It's just like in our radiotherapy field, we commission twin planning systems and other, you know, models constantly, right? You when you have a, in a new planning system, you need or new machine, new Linux, you need to commission, match them, right? You need to commission your, your, your software to match your data machine, to match your data, right? So, so, so this kind of concept, I think, can be used for AI in medicine too. Why you want to have a universal model for, works for all the patients in the world? You just need a model that works for your patient, for your hospital, for your machines, right? So, I give you an example. Those predictions. So, uh, our student lawyer worked with uh, Dan and Dr. Lin Muhanning uh, on this project uh, to predict those distribution based on patient's anatomy for prostate VMA treatment. <laughs> so we found out, you know, even within UT Southwestern for prostate VMA, we have different types of those distributions. They look, if you look at this, they look quite different. You have, we have four styles, you know, physicians and dosimetries, they, they have different personal styles. So you cannot train one model that works for all four styles. So then what we did is, um, we train the model using one style, we call it source model, source data, with one of the eight, eight patients. And then we did two things. One, we want to see how this model works, you know, this source model works for those target data sets, right? And if it does not work, can we do a quick transfer learning using much less patients, right? And also work with Sebastian uh, in uh, Belgium, or Netherlands, I'm sorry, Netherlands. So they're, for the same beam and prostate, their dose distributions are quite different from ours, right? So then we have the same question, can this source model work for their data? If not, can we do a quick transfer learning using only 20 patients, right? So this is how the source model works on, its, on the source data set. So that's quite nice. On the, you know, other data sets actually is not very good. Actually, let's focus on the uh, external data set. You know, you can see this is the, their clinical plan from this Netherlands uh, uh, institution. This is the source model, you know, they're quite different. But after transfer learning, you can see it looks much better now. And we also use DICE score to quantify the, you know, similarity of two those distributions, because you, you can look at the different acidose level. At each acidose level, you have a surface, acidose surface, right? So it defines a volume. You can compare your predicted acidose volume with the you know, clinical plan acidose volume to calculate the uh, uh, dice coefficient. And uh, the, the green curves is the source model. Without transfer learning, you see it doesn't work very well. But after transfer learning, you see the huge improvement of the performance, right? So this shows us, number one, uh, you know, you cannot have one model for those prediction works for all the hospitals. You know, with the same hospital, you may have different planning styles. So number two, transfer learning, model commissioning can work quite well with a small number of patients. Another similar example is for CT to CBCT to CT uh, conversion. Uh, Xiaoliang is a, is a graduate student in our group. She did this work. She first published the paper uh, two years, last year, actually got the Roberts uh, Best Paper Award uh, for 2019 of PMB uh, to use a cycle gain uh, to improve CBCT into CT uh, quality. Uh, so then this paper of hers is trying to study, you know, how the, the, the generalizability issue of this model, right? So she has like, a, you know, six or seven data sets, uh, you know, head and neck, variant, different uh, scanning protocols. 
uh, prostate variant, prostate 2 electa, then, you know, other sites electa. So she trained the source model. She, she used this first two as the uh, source data set to train the source model. And I want to see so how the performance of this model on the other data sets, right? So, 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 the, so she applied first the source model to the prostate one data set, which has the same vendor, right? Just different site, uh, tumor sites, right? So you can see this is CBCT. Look at the MAE. Actually, CBCT versus ground truth is quite bad. But if you apply the model directly to the prostate one, uh, which is same vendor, different anatomic sites, it still works quite quite well. Of course, they can do transfer learning. There are different ways of transfer learning. They also work, uh, improved slightly. But in this case, it shows different tumor sites do not matter. What matters is the vendors, right, in this case. So then she applied the same model to another data set, positive two. In this case, you have the electron machines there. So this is a different vendor. And then you see the, this the source model does not work well now, right? So you have to do adaptation. Then you find the model, you know, improve dramatically with, a, with only 15 patients to adapt the model. So another challenge is the lack of uh, ground truth. I, I always, uh, you know, say that medicine is still an art in many cases. Evidence-based medicine and clinical trials only give physicians the floor, not the ceiling, so that there is still room for physicians to exercise their own judgments, right? So like artists, that, which means same patient can be treated differently by different physicians, right? Uh, and and uh, variations exist in physicians' clinical practice. There is often no ground truth to tell you which one is right, which one is better, uh, sometimes you can, but a lot of times you cannot tell. They're, they're all good physicians, you know, good practice. It's just different, different personal styles. So how AI can help in this situation? Our idea is personalized AI for physicians. I'll give you one example. So Angela Lee is our graduate student. She worked on the post op prostate CTV segmentation. Uh, the the, the prostate has been surgically removed. Uh, you know, you have residual tumor cells which are not visible in CT, MRI. So it's, so it's not an object, object defined with a boundary in the image. Uh, so because of that, you have to use information, you know, outside the image and there's large variety among physicians. So uh, in her work, so she developed this kind of deep learning framework to do the uh, localization first for each organ, then you segment the organs first, and then you use the segmented organ to segment the CTV, right? So, so this is how you do it, how physicians do it manually, right? So you use the uh, laboring organs as a reference to define the uh, CTV. Then she also developed uh, anatomy guided multi-task network for CTV segmentation. And here you see, she got a very good results. So also she worked with Stan Wen to estimate uncertainty of your uh, contours. Like in this case, those, uh, uh, you know, yellowish area defines the uncertainty. So in this area, you see large uncertainty because some physicians will go into blenders more than others, right? So, so you see the large uncertainties in those areas. And then when you have an AI contour together with the um, uh, uncertainties, then physicians can pay more attention to those uh, uh, area with large uncertainty. They don't have to go through you know, every slice one by one. They don't have to look at every part of the contours. They just focus on where you tell them there's a large uncertainty. So this way, will become much more efficient. Otherwise, if they have to look at everything by themselves, they may not want to use this tool. They may just contour everything by themselves, right? So another study is uh, she then asked residents to segment CTVs and compare with AI. We use, uh, we compare residents contour with physicians and we compare AI contour with physicians. And you can see those uh, 
blue bars are AI results, and this uh, um, red curve is resident results. You can see there is a, a big improvement. So AI can beat residents easily. So that means when you have residents to do initial contours for finishings, you probably can have AI to do that. Residents can just you know, be part of the learning process. So we also use, we did a rigor study using physicians to locate the, those contours uh, and ask them to score from one to four. You know, when you look at contour, you tell me uh, if it's four, you can accept this contour without changes, three with minor changes, two with major changes, one, this is totally garbage, right? Ask them to score the AI contours and also the, their clinical contours. So what we found is very interesting, right? So if, if they look at the contours originally done by themselves, uh, they gave uh, AI 3.4, gave, uh, uh, gave, gave their own contours 3.4 on average, gave AI 3.2, very similar. They slightly prefer their own contours done by a year, two years ago than AI's contour, but very similar. But if you look, ask them to look at the other physicians' contours and AI contours, they gave other physicians 3.1, give AI 3.3, which is kind of consistent with this. So they like AI contours better than their cardiac contours, right? So that's quite interesting. So uh, then next step is then uh, Anjali, after training CTV model, she can actually uh, adapt the model to each physician. We have four physicians here. You can see the improvement of the performance. So we think, uh, so she did a very interesting study, looking at 340 you know, patients by four physicians here. She trained the classification model. And then she found out AI can tell you if you give AI the CT and the CTV contour, AI can tell you which physician did this work with 90% accuracy. So we, we, we are trying to develop this, uh, this kind of personalized AI tour. You know, we can adapt the AI model to each physician and then physician, when they do the countering, there is a menu. They can choose their own results or their own style or MD Anderson style or their colleague style, right? So this we, uh, we think this is a good solution to this type of uh, personalized per, you know, preference situation. Virus is a big issue in AI in medicine, right? Uh, virus, we all know that exists in medicine, but AI can make them automated and invisible. And, uh, uh, you know, AI, in, virus in AI is many from the data. Uh, and also, uh, so we have to design AI that is fair to all the physicians and the clinicians. Um, I'll, jump, I'll ask you if this um, data event evo evolution is a big challenge too. Basically, uh, you know, model trend today may not work sometime later. So there is a decay of the model performance with time. And, uh, you know, each, each trend AI model has a half-life. So you need to have some sort of evolving models, not static models. It's an interesting research area. And also explainability. Uh, a lot of people are working on that. They don't like AI to be a black box, but some people are okay with that, such as Jeff Clinton says, ah, it's not a big deal and now it works. So a lot of work in this area, how to uh, make it more and more explainable. So I want to stop here so that we have enough time for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for the excellent talk, uh, starting with uh, how AI can improve accuracy, efficiency, and transfer expertise. Then uh, how it can be used in the source limited situation and that raising the controversial question of training there, uh, that without training, the work can be done. Uh, then dose estimation, dose calculation, positioning, and 
uh, in anything new, there is initially enthusiastic phase and critical phase and then uh, realistic phase. Uh, it appears that in many situations, uh, we are uh, reaching the realistic assessment, uh, the examples you gave. Uh, you gave example of uh, smart cleaning with the tracking and research to clinic, the scientific issues and operational issues, and then personalized AI for physicians. And that's really wonderful. And ultimately bias and fairness. So this is a, a exciting area. I am sure all the participants must have been really excited and uh, feeling that uh, it seems that we are all going to use AI not too in distant future. And you started with a very nice example of you driving the driverless car for the last three years. So that was an excellent example of you using the <laughs> machine intelligence. So with that, uh, we will uh, have time for questions. We already have uh, several questions and maybe I can pick up some of them. One I have is uh, AI for soft data set in nuclear medicine for comparison with breast cancer. Somebody is asking that. I think we are uh, going to have a next webinar on radiomics, so perhaps that will be taken care there. But uh, Steve, if you want to say something on that, or uh, I think probably it's better to leave to a next okay. webinar. Thank you. So the next question was on legal challenges of AI-driven solutions versus the human experience. That's a very good question. Uh, I. I don't believe, like I said, we should not be, try to replace our physicians or physicists or any clinical staff with AI. Uh, I think AI will be just serving as a system uh, in clinical procedures to help physicians, physicians to perform their job better, faster, easier, right? So the final decision will still be made by the clinical staff, not by the AI. So that means the liability is still, is still on the clinicians, uh, not on AI. So that's what I believe. Is there uh, anything already decided on that? Because I remember that whenever machine is brought in, the regulators always uh, point out that who has the responsibility. Uh, can the responsibility be assigned to the machines or the human responsibility? Uh, remains. Do you have some idea on any regulatory aspects on that? I, 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 I don't think uh, uh, there is a very clear uh, decision on that or uh, consensus on that right now. Also, I, 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 my uh, impression is from what I, read in, what I read and what I heard, what I you know, talked to people about, uh, companies are not going to assume the liability for their AI software, right? That doesn't make sense. They won't do that. Nobody will do that. So the, the, it, it's going to be uh, the users uh, taking the liability. AI is going to provide you with a suggestion that you are the person making the uh, final decision, right? Right. Uh, another question is patient QA with uh, AI models. So what do you think is the uh, scope for that? Yes, AI yeah, definitely can play an important role there for patient QA, uh, especially for adaptive radiotherapy, right? For online adaptive therapy. So my colleague Darwin, Yu Zhang and myself, we just submitted a NH grant uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, trying to develop AI-based uh, uh, toolkits uh, for online ART uh, QA. Because there, uh, so think about it, we have uh, MR Linux now, right? We are getting two unities in our department. Uh, so that's very nice. You know, you can do a lot of, uh, you know, adaptive therapy, online adaptive therapy. You can uh, contour it, you know, organs, targets, uh, every fraction and adapt your plan to that. So, but there is also an added pressure because the patient's lying there. Uh, you want to get everything done quickly, right? So that you can treat the patient. 
because of that kind of pressure, there's a higher risk of making errors, right? So you need better QA tools, better than what we have now. Uh, not only faster, I think it's also more comprehensive, more intelligent, right? And we think AI can help uh, you know, in that area. Thank you. Another question I see is about the problems with the codes not being made public. And you mentioned about McKinney. Uh, and do you think more research should be, uh, should release the code and model they develop for their papers? Uh, and the questioner is asking this will address some of the issues in AI and make sure the software is reliable and reproducible. Very good question. Very good question. I, I, in the AI community, it's kind of common practice, you know, to when you publish your paper, you need to share your code, share your model, share your data even, right? So we have been trying to do that uh, in our uh, Maya lab, trying to, you know, uh, share the model. At least patient data is difficult to share, but uh, under a very special situation, maybe it can be arranged. But like I said, Patient data sharing is very challenging. The hospitals don't like that. You know, there's not only patient privacy issue, and also there is some like uh, politics, or uh, they, they think there is uh, uh, patient data is uh, uh, very valuable to the hospital. They don't want just you know be shared with other research uh, groups. So, so but the model at least uh, can be shared. I think. So that, that is the that is the trend. Otherwise, how do I know your you know how do I validate your mother, published mother, right? So so I agree. We we should uh, promote that kind of practice. Thank you. Are there any FDA guidelines on that issue? Uh, no, this is for research sharing. We're talking about research sharing, right? not for clinic. You cannot use the mother directly in the clinic. Uh, for research, uh, it's possible. For clinical use, the answer is probably is no. You have to go through uh, likely a vendor to make it into a product, get the FDA clearance, and then this can be used uh, in other hospitals. Otherwise, you can use in US. You can use your own developed AI models in your own hospital, in your own on your own patients. Now, it might be okay with you know some considerations but not, nobody wants to use it for other people's, other hospitals' patients. There's a huge uh, liability issue. Thank you. Another question I see is what kind of networks are better for segmentation, auto planning and QA? Oh, <laughs> that, that is uh, the, too general because there are so many uh, little works out there. Depends on your specific uh, application, even for segmentation, you know, of course, Yolet is very popular, but there are also, you know, other uh, later works out there. Uh, so I, my suggestion is uh, take a look at the, those recent uh, publications and you will find out, you know, you know, what is the, uh, uh, the most uh, current and maybe accurate uh, models right now. And a lot of this kind of work is from uh, computer vision, right? If you look at literature in that field, and then you find out maybe you know, those uh, work can be used for maybe imaging too, right? So, so yeah, there's no simple answer to that question. Thank you. Another question is federal learning is also used for data sharing. What's your opinion about federal learning in radiotherapy? Federality learning, uh, I think it, it will solve the problem partially. We actually tried to do that uh, two or three years ago and I realized uh, it is not easy. Uh, after that, we didn't you know, do much work. So I don't know, maybe it's better now, but at that time, uh, it requires each participating site to have a, you know, a sufficient computation resource because the model will also be you know, uh, trained on their uh, computers, GPUs there, right? All the sites will provide their own uh, computing resources. And also you need someone with sufficient 
uh, expertise uh, on each local side uh, to, be, to, be, to do this work together. We found that challenging because if you want to get data from a hospital, if it's a pure, you know, it's not an academic center, then it's, it's not easy to ha have these kind of resources. Uh, so, so that's why also data curation, data cleaning, uh, they have to do it locally and uh, that's a lot of work too. Uh, I just found that it, it's not easy. It probably will help, um, but, but not as easy as one may think. Thank you, excellent. Uh, another question, I don't know if you are the right person to answer this or one has to ask the Google <laughs> search. Uh, the questioner is, is asking, is saying, I am an endourologist and would like to ask what is, in your opinion, the referring, refer, uh, referring references to get started on AI in medicine? What would you recommend us reading? Oh, so... And the, for clinician, right? Um, typically, I assume you 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 are not trained in uh, computer science or or even medical physics or any technical uh, disciplines. So your uh, role in this type of AI research is more like to collaborate with someone with deep learning AI background. But you you can provide your clinical uh, questions, projects, patient data. And also, you need to have insights uh, on this pro on the problem. So, so what you need on the AI side, deep learning side, is to have a sufficient understanding, you know, how it works. You know, what 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 you can do, what you cannot do, what's the limit, right? So that kind of knowledge is important for this kind of collaboration. But I don't encourage I don't encourage you to learn everything by yourself. You know, take Andrew's deep learning course on that. You can do that, but I don't think it's the best way. To go because it take you a lot of efforts and then you will still struggle with uh, you know model training computational resources and all this and that it's better for you to find the, a good collaborator on the computer science part and then on your side you still need to have some understanding uh, of deep learning i will see there are some uh, review articles if you search ai or deep learning in medicine or healthcare this kind of keywords you'll find there are quite some uh, review articles and give you uh, some, some ideas. I'm not sure if there are any existing courses for physicians for AI right now. We have been thinking, talking about that in our lab. We want to develop these kind of courses, particularly for physicians, right? Not for, you know, a, a, a computer science guys, for physicians to give them uh, sufficient uh, knowledge and understanding so that we can work with uh, computer scientists. So we are thinking of that, but so far I have not seen good courses uh, in that area right now. Thank you. Another very interesting question is on COVID-19 related pneumonia detection. And the questioner is asking, do you have comment on the role of AI when the ground truth is weak? Is it helping or should be temporarily avoided until a sort of ground truth is, avail truth is available. And he's referring to the current trend of AI-based COVID-19 related pneumonia detection. As we know, this disease has relatively unknown characters. Right, right, right. Very good question. Um, of course, like a few months ago, you know, I looked at this quiz, uh, this problem, right? Uh, and then there are many people looking at that, I believe. I saw a lot of publications or discussions on that. I always had the doubt, right? Like you said, <laughs> you know, how many patients you have, one, two, and all this. Uh, can you have a reliable model? Until I saw a work um, published in Cell. Uh, this is a very good journal, Cell, right? By Professor Kang Zhang. Uh, who is uh, in uh, Macau Science and Technology University, I believe. And they have, uh, I forgot how many patients, they have a large number of patients. And they collaborate uh, with uh, you know, some Chinese hospitals. So they have a, you know, a lot of patients. Their model performs very well. I remember it's like 90%. AUC is about 0.9 uh, for this kind of pneumonia detection. So, so now I'm kind of convinced it may work. So uh, interesting in looking into that, see if we can be you know, implemented 
uh, clinically because it can be a very useful tool. Like uh, in radiology, there's a lot of CT, chest CT performed every day. It's eight o'clock. In radiotherapy, we do a lot of uh, uh, simulation CT scans. If you have this tool developed, you know, automatically detect if this patient has any, you know, suspicion with positive COVID-19 or not, right? So that would be an interesting tool because also I think COVID-19 may stay here for a while. It's not going to be gone quickly, right? Ah, thank you very much. Uh, there are lots and lots of other questions, but we are having shortage of time as always. So I think uh, uh, I will have to stop here. And Magdalena, can you present the next uh, webinar slide in the meantime when I am talking? So I, I wish to sincerely thank you on behalf of myself and on behalf of IOMP and also on behalf of all participants for the wonderful talk, full of knowledge, excitement, and the question answer session was very enlightening. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And it's, it's a really great honor that we have the possibility to provide interaction of your expertise with huge number of participants from so many countries. Thank you once again. And I wish to thank all the participants uh, in the today's webinar of the IUMP through IUMP school. And the next webinar on artificial intelligence is on 9th of uh, uh, July. I was looking for slide to present, so let me see if I can do that. Otherwise, Magdalena, if you can present that slide before we close. Uh, I am finding difficulty to show my slide. Uh, anyhow, so let us not waste time. The next webinar is on radiomics. It will, there will be two presenters, one from the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, and another from France. And the time will be same as today, but the date is on 9th July, Thursday. So with that, we'll close today's session and thank you all once again. And we look forward to see you. So this is a slide ultimately, it, it has come. So, and we look forward to see you in the subsequent webinars. Um, so after this 9th July, also there is a CT uh, webinar, which was already announced. So this this one will be announced uh, today uh, through the inter um, through the IUMP email. Thank you so much, and I will close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Madan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye.